Tenotato Katoa. I'm Richard Templer, Chief Executive of Te Aurangaho Engineering New Zealand. This week, we are delighted to launch our climate change program, Engineering Climate Action. Taking action on climate change is something we feel very strongly about and which members have been asking for. Engineering Climate Action will support you, our members, as well as the engineering community and government to take positive action to respond to climate change. We'll be providing resources to help you at the website engineeringclimateaction.nz. We're presenting this webinar as part of our launch week, and we hope to follow it up with further webinars so that we can get more voices and more ideas from more engineers. It's taken a lot of work to get this point, and I want to thank all who have helped us at this stage, branches, technical groups, our advisory group, and our members. I'd now like to hand over to Tania Williams, one of our general managers here at Te Ao Rangaho, to MC this webinar. Over to you, Tania. Kia ora, and what a wonderful turnout. We are, we are thrilled to have um, all of you join us uh, today, and so many, even from as far away as the UK. So thank you so much for joining us on this. Further to what Richard said, I'm really passionate in this area and I would understand that you all are too. We believe that engineering professionals have a really vital role in mitigating, transitioning and adapting to climate change. And that's why we've got everyone together to start this climate uh, action area. No profession is better placed in society than we are. And we're just all looking to how we can uh, best do that. So yeah, really appreciate the passion here. Today's webinar is, is part of our launch week and it's to really uh, start us in a good direction. We are really thrilled to have some amazing guests with us today. Uh, so uh, Bridget Burdett and I'm going to try and say them in order, Jonathan Chambers, uh, Sandika Manakara and uh, Lise Lysart have all um, been are all outstanding leaders in this field in different areas and we're really thrilled that they could um, come today to talk to us about what it, it means to them for engineering a healthier more sustainable Aotearoa. So I know that we've asked you as well some of the rules as Kirsty was saying at the beginning uh, you will see at the bottom the Q&A panel at the end of uh, the four presentations we will uh, be asking the questions of the panelists so please uh, all the way through start putting your questions in there so that we can use that. The webinar is being recorded so anybody who missed it and you think could benefit from it please uh, let them know how wonderful uh, it is so that they can uh, look afterwards and with that I'm going to start with Bridget on the question of yeah, as I said what is what does engineering a healthier more sustainable Aotearoa mean to you now we are thrilled to have Bridget I have heard her speak with passion a number of times and know uh, just the passion she has for this area Bridget is a transportation engineer and researcher with a doctorate in cognitive psychology no less she is the chair current chair of engineering New Zealand's transport group and a principal researcher at MR Cagney based in Hamilton. She works on transport research policy and practice for various government, university and private sector uh, clients nationwide. So welcome Bridget. Kia ora Tato and thank you Tanya. I'll assume you can all hear me unless I'm swiftly interrupted. What does engineering a healthier sustainable Aotearoa mean to me? Ko Nati Pakiha Toku Iwi no Kirikiri Roa Aho, ko Doran Toku Fano, ko Bridget Budet Toku Ingwa. Kia ora koutou. I am Bridget and I am a transportation engineer in Hamilton. When I think of this question, healthier sustainable Aotearoa, I think of three things. Who are we as engineers? What horizon are we seeking to cross? And how might we go about doing that? So firstly, who are we as engineers? And I like to think about in this context, what sets engineers apart? 
I think it is that we are creative people. It's funny because I never used to think about engineering as creative, art as creative, right? Music and painting and poetry. Engineering was for kids who were good at maths and good at following a process, but any robot can follow a process. So I think what sets us apart is our ability to apply that logical thinking to real world problems in creative ways. And I've heard intelligence, for example, defined as the ability to understand how things as they are, understand the world as it is. Whereas imagination is the ability to understand how things could be. So if you add intelligence and imagination, you get creativity and originality, which makes for intelligent forecasting of a better world. And that sums up a good engineer, I think. So what horizons are we seeking to cross? Climate change is clearly changing how we work really rapidly and front of mind for me on that horizon is also inequity. The people of Aotearoa don't all have the same life experiences and it's not fair. Inequity is worsening within a climate crisis that is rooted in decades, as we know, of growing excessive consumption, mostly by the wealthiest people, which leaves marginalised people behind. So as we move beyond our old horizons, how do we go about reducing consumption and making the world fairer? I think there are two responses that come to mind in my profession using it as an example, which is transportation engineering. So first response is to change our assumptions that have informed planning and design for decades. We used to assume, for example, that car traffic is both necessary and growing. Those assumptions aren't rooted in the laws of physics and we can throw them in the bin if we want to. We can change the goal in transport, therefore, from optimising a road network for car traffic to optimising something else, like bringing people together, perhaps, or maximising happiness or making life fun. There's no reason we can't introduce new goals like that, really audacious ones, like living a little. <laughs> and changing the goal of a system is super powerful. If we don't need to accommodate growth in traffic, for example, and the associated massive amounts of land that we devote to roads and driveways and parking, we can reallocate that space to people, people walking, people on bikes. We could give a lane of a bridge to bikes, for example, or buses. We can close neighbourhood streets to through traffic, making safe spaces for families to walk to the shops, for kids to go to school. And if we do that, if we change the system goal, we get healthier, more sustainable local travel, and we all slow down. And I think that's super important. In the fresh air of our local streets, we start to look each other in the face more easily to interact with people around us. And from that perspective, reduced consumption starts to reveal more benefits than costs. So if the first step is changing the goal, the second step has to be building on that local interaction with more collaboration throughout the whole system. And I believe collaboration is central to this whole concept of a healthy and sustainable future. Collaboration is good because it builds on all of our strengths. It bridges a gap where my expertise ends and another's begins, and it creates opportunities for that creativity I talked about earlier to really deliver change for the better. And of course, engineers, we are good at a lot of things, right? But we're not politicians, we're not ecologists, and we're not early childhood teachers. All of these people have a role in healthy communities. So working together makes the best use of engineers' creative minds to get the best outcomes for this world we want to be part of building. So I think it is hugely exciting times, challenging of course, but that's why we're all here. So what an opportunity. And as engineers, we've never been better placed to do good. And in doing so to respond to our ethical code of conduct, which says that we act with honesty, objectivity and integrity. So to me, that means our actions are grounded in science and delivered with manaakitanga to the best of our ability. So in summary, engineering a healthier, sustainable Aotearoa, to me, it means collaboration, creativity, and manaakitanga. So I'm going to leave you with a favourite whakatauki of mine, and it is this. No te roro, nāku te roro, ka ora ai te iwi. With your food basket and my food basket, the people will thrive. Kia ora koutou. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, I completely agree. That has given us, in a very short period, uh, a lot to, to think about. I, I love the challenge of the goal and collaboration, as we can see on a world stage, is critical. Uh, 
yeah, hard one, but critical at this point. So thank you uh, for that. And anybody who has questions for Bridget, if you could put them in the question and answer, we'll get to them at the end, but just want to make sure you don't uh, miss the opportunity. But thank you again, Bridget. My next up is uh, Jonathan Chambers. Now, Jonathan is an environmental engineer based in Auckland, uh, working for Harrison Grierson. And he his expertise spans stormwater and flood hazard management, water sensitive for urban environments and sustainability. He has recently been working on, in the coastal communities to understand climate impacts on natural hazards and was awarded our very own Young Engineer of the Year Award in uh, this year's MV Award. So congratulations, Jonathan. And uh, I, I know that we've taken you away from your shopping now in Auckland but, to be here, but we're very grateful to have you uh, online with us today. I'll hand over to you now. Ina tato katoa ko Taranaki te maunga ko te ono roho te awa ko Tamaki Aho ko Chambers toku Fano ko Jonathan toku Ingoa. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It's an honour to speak today. So I'm going to answer the question with a story. Um, earlier this year, I was working with a community group doing some modelling to understand the impacts that climate change might have on flood hazards to the community um, that you mentioned. Uh, and I won't get into specifics here just to keep it confidential. Um, what we did through this project is we provided some insights around to what extent the severity of the flooding they're facing might change. And this contributed to an ongoing body of work that was driven by the community, trying to get agreement on what their response might be. You know, do they build up their defences? Do they try and retreat from the coast and the river? Essentially getting at what parts of their life should they hold on to? When should they do it by and what's the best way to fund it? Now, I worked on this for quite some time and I thought it was quite a successful project. I'd spent months reading up on climate projections and flooding and researching um, the history of the town, real good nerdy stuff. And in my mind, I had a really comprehensive and well-informed understanding of what was at stake and why. And then one of the community members, um, Frank, invited me to come and spend an afternoon with him. Um, and so I spent an afternoon in the youth with Frank. Frank's a member of the local iwi, um, which I, I won't name, uh, who has lived on the coast his whole life. Now, Frank and I drove up and down the coastline. We looked at the streams, we looked at the floodplains, and we looked at the eroded coastline. And he shared his stories with me. We talked about all of the different changes in the land use throughout the catchment. We, he told me about the points where the waka landed, where the six pass sites were in relation to the stream, and where the streams were diverted to build the state highway and the impact that had on the community. And getting even further back, where the Coast Guards had marched along the beach after shelling the neighbouring settlement back in 1863. So I learned a really valuable lesson on that day from Frank. Um, it was quite challenging. I learned that my perspective was a really rigid, westernized, technocratic perspective that didn't actually recognize the bigger picture of what was at stake for the community as the sea level froze. And that, for Frank, was really the cultural heritage and all of the social infrastructure that surrounded it. Now, I'm, I'm a firm believer of engineering serving everyone and trying to be a good ancestor. And I, I learned in that day that if I was to live those values, I'd need to reflect on who I am, where I've come from, and what's informed my beliefs, really getting into my cultural competency. And it left me with a far better understanding of the values that the people in the community had, and it equipped our team to advocate for the community with the councillors who were responsible for making the important funding decisions around the future of the town. I can confidently say that if I hadn't had that experience with Frank in the Ute, uh, we wouldn't have been able to achieve such a positive outcome, um, and it's a work in progress now. And it's really just reflecting on the fact that the engineering profession has historically disenfranchised Tangata Whenua in a lot of ways, and it's going to be a very long journey to start unpicking all of that. So leading on from that, um, doing some research around climate change and social inequity, um, th there are three main ways that I see that it, that it affects people. First of all, it increases vulnerable people's exposure to adverse effects, whether it's extreme weather or less direct impacts. It increases vulnerable people's susceptibility to damage when those events occur, and it reduces vulnerable people's ability to cope and recover from the damage, so after an event. And these ring true for both physical and transition risks associated with our changing climate. So after that experience, I wanted to find ways to connect with people who are working to improve outcomes for vulnerable members of our communities and use my skills to help out. For me, that meant getting involved at a governance level with organisations that have a really clear purpose and vision and are driven by their values and trying to raise the bar for their communities. And really excited to say I'm now involved with an awesome charitable organisation called the Te Whangai Trust. And I thought this is a really good example of really where you can get to if your organisation has a very clear perspective on what it is there to achieve and how it does it. 
So the way that this trust works is it provides work and life skills training and advocacy for the most vulnerable members of our communities who essentially find themselves at a disadvantage through their current circumstances and helps them transition back into community life and employment. Now the trust does this through its plant nursery and agribusiness and its operations are rooted in Kaupapa Māori. The United Vision is to support whānau and communities to eradicate poverty in a way that it reduces inequality and exclusion while protecting the environment and nurturing the people so that they can in turn create a legacy for future generations. And I, I just thought, I haven't heard of an organisation um, based in Aotearoa that has a more direct connection between the work that they do and the outcomes that they're creating. And what's amazing is that it can report directly in terms of its impacts across a quadruple bottom line, which is so empowering. It becomes, we're supporting this many families with sustainable employment. We've sold this many native plants and they'll sequester this much carbon. And we have saved the taxpayer this much in benefit payments. And it's really getting to that quadruple bottom line model. And so the lesson there for the engineering practice could be more about what engineering organizations can do. Many engineering firms are now becoming quite purpose-driven and exploring their social license, particularly in terms of te Māori sustainability and resilience. But there aren't so many that can connect their work that they do in such a direct manner. And my expectation of this program is that it will enable engineers and engineering organizations to advocate for better outcomes on a larger scale through collaborations and partnerships to create sustainable outcomes for the communities that we're involved in. An example of this is the sustainability journey that we're on at Harrison Grierson. We're trying to look beyond carbon and go beyond our operational footprint to address the outcomes that our projects enable. And that can be quite a confronting thing. You know, when you look at the embodied and operational emissions associated with things like earthworks and civil construction and house building, it's quite confronting. But that's just the start of it. Once a new community is built, it might be inhabited for centuries to come. And you start to tap into a whole body of research around different types of urban forms and the lifestyles they reinforce, particularly around energy uses and transport choices. So the way that we build our infrastructure does have a really tangible effect on how our communities develop, which in turn leaves a legacy for generations to come. Essentially, the infrastructure that we as engineers develop is typically feasible from an economic perspective, but nine times out of 10, we are blind to the social and cultural impacts associated with what we build. So the economics are flawed and the environmental degradation and emissions factors are externalized. And it would be interesting to see how that picture changes if we addressed it from a different perspective. So the, to summarize, one way for us to engineer a healthier, sustainable Aotearoa is for all of us to go and find our Frank and spend an afternoon in the ute with them, metaphorically speaking. You will learn something new, you'll challenge yourself and you'll become a more rounded engineer in the process. Let's adapt and find ways to become more purpose-driven and advocate for better outcomes through the work that we do, the way we communicate, and go beyond carbon, taking a holistic approach to resource use and planning with our ecological foundation in mind. And I'm approaching seven minutes. I'll leave you with a whakitoki. Fatungarongaro uh, te tangata tuetu te whenua. As people disappear from sight, the land remains. That essentially speaks to the importance and of permanence of land while people come and go, the land remains. We must think long-term and see the big picture to ensure the future of our home. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, once again, a huge amount to think about. Storytelling is so important in all parts of this journey to help all the stakeholders to really understand. And Frank's storytelling helped you. Your storytelling is helping us. So uh, I hope that everybody has had the opportunity to meet a Frank uh, in their career or will in the future because they play a vital role and also being able and willing to challenge your own perspective and your background and, and how you see the world is vital in being able to, to get this. So a lot there as well as the challenges to the firm. So uh, thank you so much, Jonathan. Really appreciate that. Once again, anyone who has questions for Jonathan, uh, please uh, put them in the Q&A panel uh, on there. Now, I am going to introduce our next speaker, but before I do so, we just have another poll about your sector. So I understand it's going up now. If you could just take a couple of minutes to put what sector you work in. This just helps us to understand what our audience is today um, in there. So just appreciate it if you take a couple of minutes to do that. All right, I'm going to keep going. We are on quite a tight time frame, but we're doing well. Uh, so next, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Dr. Sandika Manakara. 
uh, is she is a University of Auckland lecturer and structural engineer. She specializes in post-disaster recovery and reconstruction, city resilience and climate change adaptation. Sandika uh, led and worked on the MB funded Resilient Cities Network Development and uh, Building Back Better projects, which are fantastic, just from a personal perspective. Uh, her interests lie in the holistic and community focused solutions, and she is working on integration of indigenous knowledge and climate change adaptation solutions for Aotearoa and else, elsewhere. Welcome, Sandika. Awesome, thank you, Tanya. Um, kia ora koutou, um, ko Tamaki Makoto Aho, ko Mana Kara Tukufano, ko Sandika Toku Ingwa. And um, I would like to begin um, my talk by first acknowledging the Tangata Whenua of Tamaki Makoto, where I'm based. Um, and also thank you to Engineering New Zealand for inviting me to talk today. And thank you to everyone in the audience for attending as well. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa. So I'm going to talk about a healthy and sustainable Aotearoa for the future in the lens of responding to climate change. Some of you may have been following the events of COP26 that's ongoing in Glasgow at the moment. And uh, as you would have heard, we are really struggling with the targets we've set in the Paris Agreement. Um, as our New Zealand's uh, Minister for Climate Change, James Shaw, recently said, Reducing emissions to mitigate climate change is a marathon, but adapting to climate change is a sprint because many countries, especially our low-lying Pacific country neighbors, are seeing and experiencing the impacts of climate change like sea level rise already right now. And even us here in New Zealand are facing very real impacts. Um, for example, our weather extremes are emerging um, last year, in early 2020, Auckland experienced its longest dry spell of 50 days, well above our usual average of 10 days. And we've been in a period of drought and water shortage until a few months ago. And around the country, we've um, recorded increasing annual rainfall with especially more intense rainfall events and changes in rainfall patterns. At the same time, we're seeing increasing trends in days of very high to extreme fire danger and droughts, along with a host of other impacts. So my research specialization is in climate change adaptation. Um, so I would like to talk about the role that engineering has to play in adaptation to ensure a healthy and sustainable Aotearoa for the future. So firstly, a few things to note about climate change. It's a game changer. Traditional risk management approaches that we employ in engineering are now becoming almost redundant in the landscape of climate change because our risks are now so different to anything we've experienced before. We're now dealing with what us researchers call unknown unknowns. Um, we are in unknown territory where we don't really know all the impacts, how big and serious they are, who will be affected, how, and when. Sure, we have better and better climate models, but we don't have enough historic data to assure certainty. We're dealing with increasing vulnerabilities. Our infrastructure is aging, our populations are increasing, leading to people having to live in risky locations. And changes are taking place very fast that are on the most part irreversible. So we need to shift from our traditional design practices based on estimated levels of specific risks and instead incorporate resilience and adaptability as core principles to the way we try to tackle this. Resilience is the ability of people, communities, systems and infrastructure to face any type of risk that's thrown at it, cope with it, recover and adapt. It's a quality that makes people and systems agile, flexible, and adaptable. Resilience is something that can be created and enhanced so that we allow wiggle room for redundancy, quick changes, and alternative options. So I'm gonna talk about five ways we need to shift our engineering practices to create resilience and adaptability. First, we have to be flexible. Resilient engineering is innovative. It's designed for redundancy and flexibility in well thought out networks so that you aren't ever relying on one thing. And it's mobile when possible. 
Second, we have to consider and understand the full range of impacts of our engineering solutions on the environment, on people's lives and lifestyles, people's livelihoods, culture, heritage, taonga, to ensure that our solutions aren't creating further negative impacts. Third, we have to be innovative. Engineering solutions for the future have to be outside the box and consider and integrate alternatives such as nature-based solutions and indigenous worldviews and knowledge systems. And this is something I'm very passionate about and, and I'm focusing my research on at the moment. Fourth, our solutions have to be context specific. The impacts of climate change are context specific and location specific. So it's important that we develop unique solutions to suit those different contexts and locations. And finally, we have to be part of creating multi-pronged solutions which are holistic. This means engineers understanding and working closely with different sectors, land use planning, social sector, health, economic sector, governance, legislation, academia, and et cetera, and, and really expanding our universe. So going forward, it's important that as engineers, the solutions that we come up with to adapt to climate change empower all populations, their culture and values and the environment. The solutions we come up with for climate change have to be value-based, people-based and environment and nature-based. Manaki whenua, manaki tangata, haere whakamoa. Care for the land, care for the people, go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Sam I, I, yeah, I, again, COP26 has been a mixed bag, but I loved the marathon and the sprint analogy. We are the unknown unknowns do scare people, but it can't be something that holds us uh, back or paralyzes us. And I love uh, your six in there around, we have to be flexible, consider impacts, innovation, context specific, holistic, and yeah. So thank you so much for sharing that and looking forward to seeing the rest of your research uh, as well. Uh, so we're almost on to our last speaker. What I would ask is, as well as putting questions, if you could vote up the questions that you have uh, for uh, guests uh, on there, so you can um, put a thumbs up on the ones that you, so we will endeavor to get answers to all questions, but if we run short of time, we want to make sure they get the questions that the majority of people want answered done first. So please uh, look at the questions that are on there already and vote up the ones uh, that you would like to hear about as well. So our fourth and final speaker this morning is Elise Lysart. And many of you will, will be familiar, hopefully, with her um, Maori and Engineering podcast. But um, uh, she affiliates with Nati Ranginui and Nati Te Rangi. She is a um, she has recently uh, graduated from the University of Canterbury Natural Resources and Humanitarian Engineering graduate. Uh, I am a graduate of Canterbury University as well, so that's great thing. Elise began her uh, rare in, uh, Māori journey at the start of her degree and she today she has a real passion uh, to lying and learning how to incorporate uh, te ao Māori and te uh, reo into engineering to better sustain for the future generations to come. As people, yeah, as I say, may, if you haven't I just a small plug for the modern engineering podcast that you see there, definitely worth a listen, but handing over to you, Elise. Kia ora ta Tanya. Uh, namahi nui kia koutou katoa. Um, thank you all for tuning in. Um, it's really cool to be on this side of the webinar. Usually I am on your side of the webinar, um, so it's a real honour to be asked to share my whakaaro, share kōrero on what engineering a healthy, sustainable Aotearoa means to me. So nā mihi kia koutou. Uh, ko e au, uh, ko māua te maunga, ko te awa nui te awa, ko mā tātua rāua, ko takitumu o ku waka. Uh, Huri o hau no nai te rangi, me nā te rangi nui i te taha māma, ko kai kohi Roritana o Rolleston, toku tupuna, he pāke a hoki toku papa, no airangi o Ireland e rā tupuna, no hakatiri a hau ki o tautahi a haui noho ana, he tauera kai pūkaha au me te whari wānanga o Waitaha. Ko Elise Lassa toku ingoa, nō reira tēnā tātou katoa. Um, kia ora, like, um, 
I'm Tanya introduced, my name is Elise. I am a soon to be recent graduate of the University of Canterbury, studying natural resource and humanitarian engineering, hopefully as of Tuesday, fingers crossed. <laughs> um, and I hail up to Tauranga Moana, Ngātirangi and Ngātirangi Nui, and am from Ashburton originally as well. Koe no. So when I was posed with this question of what engineering and health is and what Aotearoa means to me, I was trying to frame it in a way that made made sense to me so as I'm at this stage in my kind of life I'm doing a lot of reflecting and reflecting to move forward moving forward to figuring out how I strategically can decide what future I want to have and this whakatoki really stood close to my heart oh, I kept it close to my heart so kia whakatoa muri si haere whakamoe I walk backwards into the future with my eyes fixed on my past and I think that's something that can be really really um used and really crucial for while we move into a future, trying to figure out and strategically decide as engineers what a sustainable and healthy Aotearoa means. So, as you may have guessed, so I think a healthy and sustainable Aotearoa means looking backwards to look forward. So what really that means to me is understanding and learning from what Aotearoa has done in the past, our engineers within Aotearoa have done in the past, what works really well, and also what doesn't work very well. Um, for me, as I'm learning, also what it means to be Māori within this space, um, as well as engineering, those kind of journeys with, of myself have ran parallel for the past four years. And the main thing what I've learned there is the inherent connection that whenua and people have, and we can really utilise that within engineering. So I have three main points of what I think healthy and sustainable Aotearoa means to me, and they all kind of have this approach of enhancing mātauranga Māori, enhancing that connection of whenua and people. So without further ado, uh, kia tuatahi. Uh, prioritizing to tile the natural environment in every single decision we make as engineers. So to me, that is prioritizing the natural environment over what is perceived to be economically maybe better or easiest, um, because as we know, when we give to tile, it gives back to us. So especially as we are, like um, Sandika said, we're facing the unknown unknowns. We really don't know what's going coming forward. So as we give to Tataio, it will give back to us so we can kind of know that that will have our back in that sort of decision. So our long-term value is far more beneficial when we prioritize Tataio in every decision we make now, and we can decide to do that today as engineers. Second point is actively and meaningfully upholding to Tiriti or Waitangi. So during university, we get taught a lot about this we get a lot of kind of buzzwords I kind of call them um, and I've seen a lot of examples of actively upholding to Tiriti or Waitangi and to me that is engaging with mana whenua um, as the Resource Management Act and the like um, kind of signify and indicate to do but sometimes this meaningfully part gets lost as well so to me actively is engaging engaging sharing corridor with mana whenua tangata whenua representatives but the meaningfully part is actually taking the corridor directly and translating it into our engineering projects and practices. So I actually tuned into a, a webinar Wednesday. So um, that described this really beautifully um, through ACE New Zealand. So maybe you can watch that after you finish this. And they were talking about how when you get gifted corridor um, from mana whenua about that area, don't put a Western kind of science or an engineering lens on that directly and changing it by the time it gets to the engineering project, but make sure that that's directly reflected within the engineering practice as well. So for me, that's a small example of how we can meaningfully uphold utility or Waitangi as we look back to understand the inequalities and inequities that are stemmed from the treaty. We can look forward to that by meaningfully uphold utility or Waitangi. Third is empowering manakitanga and kaitiakitanga of Māori through engineering projects. And again, as we do that, we're empowering Māori to be Māori. We are empowering te noranga teratanga as by te tiriti o waitangi. And the context that we have in Aotearoa is so unique and so special. And we can do that through, and we can adhere to that through empowering manakitanga and kaitiakitanga within projects as well recognizing the bicultural narratives that we have as a society and understanding that our engineering projects and what we're engineering for isn't for a monocultural society, it's for a bicultural society too. So kind of the overarching theme that all of these three points sit um, under 
is this whole whakaaro on when iwi Māori thrive, the nation thrives. So this I learned from Deb Takawa um, at the beginning of the year, a fantastic person, and she's really instilled this in with me, and I'm going to be taking this as I look into the future for myself and within the engineering um, space that I'll be venturing into. And I really think that when we address, when we look back, when we understand the social inequities that are within Aotearoa at the moment, we as engineers have a responsibility to build our natural and built environment to address those. And I think a massive takeaway from that is understanding that when iwi Māori thrive, the nation thrives. Nā mihi nui kia koutou, kia ora tato. Kia ora, Elise. Thank you uh, so much for that. I, um, yeah, I don't know where to start. I love the, and I will take it forward as well, when iwi thrive, the nation thrives. Uh, I love the focus on the natural environment, the upholding of te tiriti uh, or uh, Waitangi. And yeah, you've, I think for someone who's about to graduate, sorry, I was one week off, uh, <laughs> you are doing amazing things and please keep going. And thank you uh, for your thoughts there, really meaningful. So with that, I'm going to bring all four of our guests uh, back if they could put on their, uh, yep, put on your videos. And now we have um, quite a number of questions. So what I'm going to try and do here is just go with, uh, I will uh, address a question to each of uh, to each of you as they come up. And I will paraphrase, sorry for those in the audience, because some of the questions are very long. I'm going to start with you, Bridget. and uh, But I will start with Bridget. And if any of the other guests would like to contribute to the question, please, after Bridget's uh, response, please don't hesitate to add into this. So forgive me, I'm going to read these now. But summary of the of quite a long question, uh, Bridget, is how should engineers approach working on projects that may have a negative impact. Uh, for example, working on roads uh, you know, aimed to increase the capacity of private motor vehicles, what is our responsibility as engineers to this? What's your thoughts on that? Well, thank you, Tanya. And uh, thanks, Andrew, I have read this question. Um, I think uh, the first approach to remember with this kind of challenge is to um, respond within a cloak of manaakitanga. So what I mean by that is that the people that we work with, the clients we work for, the government organisations that we work for are all at different stages of their climate change journey. And I think it is firstly most helpful to be mindful and um, appreciative of working with um, these organisations and not becoming you know, adversarial or sticking our feet in the sand because if we get kicked out of the game, then we're not going to get any points. <laughs> so with that in mind, I think um, the, the best approach for an engineer in this context is to um, go, take a step back and say, what question are we really trying to answer here? We've jumped to a solution, for example, a new traffic lane, but how can we solve the real problem? And a lot, often with climate change uh, response, that seems for me to come back to the local community or the community that we're doing um, some kind of intervention in, going back and talking to that community. And like I said in my talk, challenging the assumptions about why we're doing this thing in the first place. So asking that community, what do you need to be happy? Is it another traffic lane? <laughs> or is that something that we're trying to in implement to make the construction sector pipeline happy? Is that the community of interest here? What's the real question that we want to answer? And I think at a more direct level, often um, in our careers, we have moments where we do need to um, take make a decision about the organisations that we work for, the projects that we sign up to, and to put a line in the sand and say, actually, for me, this is, this is not within my comfort zone for these reasons, and I don't know whether I should do that. And there are organisations, like I work at Emma Cagney, and we only work on sustainable transport projects. So we say no quite often, because we're very cognizant, as Jonathan alluded to, of the social outcomes of the projects that we work on. So it's up to us as individuals sure, but within a specific context, I think taking a step back, engineers are really good at defining problems, but going back and asking them again and just challenging ourselves, what's the real question that we're trying to answer here? Thank you, Bridget. Would any of the other guests like to speak on this one? All right, Jonathan, you're up next. Uh, so the question, again, shortened slightly, is how can we work across government and discipline silos to get better outcomes? 
Yeah, and that's that's the big question, isn't it? Um, look, I think I'll, I suppose, speak to the, the project example that I gave before. So that, that's an example of a project where um, both a district and a regional um, government body are very heavily involved and, um, you know, attend all of the community meetings and very familiar with all of the residents and go down there for a coffee often, um, that type of relationship. What's worked there is that it's not so much what the um, government bodies are doing, is it's the relationships that they've formed in terms of creating a really well integrated um, community group, which are essentially bringing people together and saying, we need to rally around this problem and we need to actually develop a solution that works for all of us. Um, what There are essentially two ways you can go there. You can have a fractured response from a community that hasn't um, united around the issue, right? And so you can get people lifting their houses or building their own flood defences and that ends up making things worse for your neighbour. And you might be high and dry, but have you considered the implications of maybe the roads washed out once a week? Um, so the flip side there is to have a, a really strong group within the community that is well supported by the government agencies. And in this case, it's local government um, to then bring everyone together. And I think in this case, it's, it's an adaptive planning pathways approach where everyone comes together and agrees, what are the things that we actually want to preserve here? What's the way of life that we're actually trying to protect? And then once we've figured that out, we can go down a pathway of saying, what are we willing to give up? How much are we willing to spend? When do we want to do it? And then keeping those um, local government bodies involved throughout that whole process so that they can bring in the technical smarts and the specialists to speak to kind of the news of that. Um, so that's worked really well in that example. Thank you, Jonathan. Anyone? I'm gonna go ahead rather than ask every time, just jump in if you want to. So Sandika, I think in these questions, um, the words that resonate with me is your unknown unknowns. Like there is a lot of this, that all these initiatives, including what we're studying is to help us to work through a journey to work out what the answers are. But Zendika, another one that I'm keen to hear your thoughts on, which um, is in here now, is how can we innovate within the system constructs that we have to, you know, that we are already working within such as the building code? Yeah, I did see that question. It's a really good question. And um, the good thing is there's a lot of positive things happening in this space. So the building code hasn't caught up quite yet, but it's getting there. We've got the MB Building for Climate Change program that's got a massive initiative heading to change all these building codes and regulations to align better with the Ministry for Environment policies around mitigation and adaptation. So those are really promising. Um, however, as you know, the building code, you know, when you look at it, there's a lot of things you can sort of work around. Uh, so th there are steps that we can take. And in terms of councils and, and consenting, um, luckily, councils are actually a, a lot more um, kind of progressive than the building code. And it, it's, it's catching up. But all councils, local government councils around New Zealand are... Um, writing up and implementing their climate action plans, climate adaptation strategies that are really um, enabling these um, innovative, you know, innovative practices to take place within their cities. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of positive things happening. Thank you. And I am trying to see this round, but Syndica, I'm going to give you another one that's um, kind of a, a slightly different take on this as how can we keep up with the changing risk paradigm and move outside our single investment risk perspectives? Yeah, that that's uh, that that's a big one, Rob. I <laughs> know, Rob. Um, curly question. So, I mean, there, there's no easy answer to that, of course. And um, in the research space, this is really the type of research that we are working very hard on trying to understand how to kind of step out and provide that systems thinking approach and then how to make that more um, practical and um, kind of provide tools to practitioners that they can more easily assess, you know, um, more holistic impacts. So kind of coming along with my background in, in the Build Back Better work that I've done, that was kind of very similar 
in what we try to do was really change how practitioners and how local governments, national governments looked at recovery so that we aren't just focusing on the built environment anymore. We, we developed a framework and a tool that forces you know, the local governments and the engineers to tick off all these social aspects, economic aspects, and all these other things, and looking at risk in different levels, looking at responding to risk in different levels. So really kind of encouraging and making the holistic and systems thinking approach easier. So in terms of the research space, that is really what we're trying to facilitate, is to provide tools so that this becomes easier in practice. So, yeah. Thank you. A very tricky question. Elise, you're up. And the question is, what's your view on the government's engagement with Māori, particularly in the current Three Waters reform? Good question. Um, I think... Um, I think there has been, like, in, like any engagement, there's always room for improvement. And I think it's a fantastic thing that Iwi Māori have an equal seat at the table as well. Um, so, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not too up to date on that um, or too equipped to answer that personally. Um, but I think Te Wai is a great thing moving forward for Iwi Māori to have a seat at the table and to have an equal seat at the table too. Thank you. And being that you're one week off grad, you know, finishing your qualification, I think uh, you're doing incredibly well. And I think, yeah, so. Right, Jonathan, people want to hear the end of the story. Uh, can you advise how you finished your community project? What did you do? Right. Yeah, no, fair question. Um, look, that's, that's a, a good one. The project is very much not finished. Um, I think it's actually necessary that it isn't something that the community rushes through. It's something that's taken a very considered approach to, and that could take years, to be honest. Um, you often have issues with schemes like this where someone comes along and says, you need to spend this much to put in this defense to fix this problem. And the community will say, well, we're already, you know, we've been flooded several times, we can't afford it right now. And then over time, people move away, and people's opinions change. And maybe you don't get flooded for a while. And then people think, well, maybe it's not an issue anymore. I'm simplifying things, grossly oversimplifying. But um, you, you do have issues when you haven't brought the whole community around the problem, and really worked very hard to help everyone understand what is it, what's in it for them and what's in it for the whole community. And so yeah, the community is really going through that process at the moment that I alluded to before of what actually do we want to preserve here? And from there, they'll be able to make decisions in hand with, you know, the, the technical specialist in the local government bodies around, well, does that mean that we put in river defence systems like we once um, looked at doing? Or do we actually put in coastal defence systems? Or do we retreat from the coast and the river entirely? And if so, where do we go and how do we fund it? So it's it needs to be a lengthy process. The challenge is when you don't have that consensus, um, people go and make decisions on their own and the community as a whole crumbles as a result. So watch this space. I'm sure it'll be a while longer to go. Absolutely. You'll have to keep us informed. All right, Bridget, throwing back to you, uh, can you comment on the living standards framework and how this is changing transportation, uh, transport policy and investment? Yeah, so I think um, the living standards framework and associated themes of well-being and equity are being bandied about a lot more. And certainly there is an advantage to that happening because the language becomes more common across all of the kinds of projects we do. I'm yet to see it directly influence investment buckets because the habits and practices that we use to decide what we invest in don't change as quickly as the cover page on the policy documents. So it is slow, but I think that like I said, the power in something like the living standards framework and even having a well-being budget is in connecting to engineers' values because no engineer gets up in the day wanting to do harms, but they sometimes lack the tools and mandates to go and challenge things and to try and do better. So I'm optimistic that we can use things like the living standards framework to um, unpack the habits and processes within our own sectors, like traffic modelling, for example, that, that is used for good and it's used for other things. And so if we can, within our own sectors, and I think that's one of the powers of engineering New Zealand's climate change approach to support us to have our own resources and connections and conversations around how can we do better? What are we doing that we need to stop doing? And how can we tweak those things so that we get those living standards outcomes and we can um, work from the sector back up to those ministries to share and to, to collaborate again with them on how to get better outcomes. 
Thank you. All right, Jonathan, got another one for you. Can you comment on finding sustainable solutions with the challenges in material availability, budget, and engineering practices and other can you know how can we work within all the constraints to get to a good out outcome? Yeah, so that that's the challenge that we're really grappling with, isn't it? Um, in terms of, I suppose, from a framework's perspective, I would look to um, what are we doing actually to enable people to you know, empower practitioners to make those tough decisions, right? So, um, you know, everyone's probably familiar with the classic um, project constraints of, you know, what's your budget, what's your program, um, and what, what level of quality are you expected to get out of it? And so I think the first one is really, um, what communications are you having? You know, are you actually discussing, say, with members of your project team, internally or externally, what the objectives that we're trying to achieve are? And I think in many cases, if you don't ask, you don't get it, right? And so it's having those brave upfront conversations um, to say, you know, we see these opportunities here, here and here to do something better, to do something different. I think it's been alluded to that often the um, the challenges around, for example, the building code and the relatively rigid structures that engineers sit in can be a barrier to that. But we won't be able to leap over that hurdle unless we actually address it directly. And then I think in terms of procurement, you have, um, you know, frameworks like, um, you know, Auckland Council's Sustainable um, Outcomes Toolkit, which um, Hermione and the team there have, you know, poured heart and soul into um, to try and improve the way that they procure professional services and all services. And so taking that approach can really formalize a lot of that work to say, we're going to support you in delivering these outcomes and we're going to create a framework that we want you to work within so that we can actually measure that. Um, so two ways there, having those conversations and setting yourself up to succeed with the right frameworks. Thank you. Now, Sandika and Bridget, either or both of you can have a go at this one. Uh, can either of you provide an insight into, um, into support for engineers working in the agricultural se sector? Um, I think the best way to do that would be to get in touch with specific um, you know, process engineers and people through Engineering New Zealand who might be working in that sector, but also to pay attention to broader conversations going on. For example, I had a broadcast conversation for the transportation group talking to Mike Joy, who's an ecologist, and we talked about agriculture and some of the fundamental challenges and kind of basics about climate change and renewable energy and, and farming and things. Um, so having ourselves educated about those fundamentals is a good idea but in terms of specifics I think finding the um, right people from Engineering New Zealand there are staff there who can point you in that direction and where groups and networks don't exist then it's absolutely um, in our power to create them and especially now in, in this era of online connection as we're all experiencing that it's as it's, it's easy as ever to connect and collaborate so I don't know Sandeek if you have any more specific um, thoughts on that. No, no, I absolutely echo what Bridget was saying. And, and of course, at the national level, there's a lot of kind of work going on in this space. Um, you know, Ministry for the Environment is a good place to start to, to kind of look at the sector specific strategies as well. Thank you, Elise. Another one from your perspective, uh, how can, should engineers engage with iwi and hapu in their projects and everyday work from again from your perspective what does good look like yeah absolutely um so good look, looks like to me is caring about the relationship a lot like working on that establishing that relationship probably going above and beyond like i said um in the rma or whatever the future of the rma is going to look like going above and beyond what's required there um and so by building a relationship by going for a cup of tea like just going to um, the marae or going to the iwi representative, um, wherever in your area, focusing on the relationship first and then doing that early on, on, on the offset before you even really need to. So then if something comes up, then you already have that relationship fostered. Thank you. All right, I've got a last question for each of you and it is your last opportunity to, um, you know, as current, all of you are current leaders in the space and will be future leaders in, as we go move through this. The last question and your final words to the uh, those that have tuned in today um, on what do you think the top environmental challenge is and what can engineers do to address this? 
so I'll, I'll start with you, Elise, um, and go backwards and end up with you, Bridget. Yeah, um, the top environmental challenge, I'll answer this um, from kind of what we can do differently. Um, so um, yeah, number one, prioritizing the natural environment. Uh, top environmental challenges are gonna be stemmed from when we don't do that, when we don't prioritize the natural environment, and also when we don't prioritize um, uh, social inequities that are here in Aotearoa as well, that'll follow on to our most environmental challenges in the future. Thank you. Sandika. Yeah, I mean, this whole thing is, is an environmental problem, isn't it? Uh, when we talk about climate change, um, it's because of the things that we have done to nature and to the environment, and now the nature and environment are reacting back and we're having to respond to that, try to reverse it, adapt. So, um, you know, some of the major environmental problems is of course the deteriorating, continuing deteriorating atmosphere and the quality of our environment that, that's continuing to occur if we continue to sort of live the way that we currently do. Um, and then we, we also have then the kind of the more adverse sides of it, like the natural disaster kind of type of things that, that we are needing to increasingly respond to, the floods, the, you know, the, the droughts, the sea level rise, and all of those things um, affect not only our lifestyles, but our livelihoods, the economy, health. Um, so it's, it's really, you know, I don't know where to even start and end. It's, it's, it's quite a lot going on. So, I mean, bringing it back to the basics, it, it is all about the mitigation and the adaptation. So um, learning more about mitigation and looking at how we can try to reduce these, the, the negative impacts that we are imposing on, on the environment. And then on the other hand, the adaptation side of it is okay, trying to understand um, the deteriorating environment, what's been happening, and then how can we become resilient to it so that we can sort of continue um, to survive and thrive, and yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. Got it. Um, yeah, for me, it's really uh, addressing it at the source, right? Um, you know, having, having looked at some infrastructural developments, um, when you really start lumping in all of your broader outcomes and impacts, uh, you can sometimes find that things become um, yeah, very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> things become essentially, um, uh, the, the, the costs outweigh the benefits to, to a pretty significant extent. And so instead of looking at how we can offset and how we can mitigate the impacts of the activities that we are um, that we are undertaking is really to look at what are the activities that we are undertaking and how can we do those differently right um, you know we have very low density communities typically in New Zealand but we still have very poor environmental outcomes in many of those same areas and so you know things like localized ecological overshoot and issues like your urban stream syndrome for example where people aren't connected with their why with their waterways anymore because it's all hidden away under the ground means that people aren't able to see the impacts that are arising from our way of living and then we're not equipping ourselves well to have those conversations so it's really addressing things up front and focusing on what we're doing not what we're doing to mitigate thank you and bridget kia ora koutou. um I think the biggest environmental challenge is overconsumption. Like at an absolute level, we consume too much and switching to electric cars is no use to anybody if we still keep driving them around everywhere on our car centric streets. So the solution to overconsumption, I think comes back to something Jonathan said, which is to for us all to become better storytellers. And when we do that, a story needs a listener. So it's again, it's about collaboration. It's about connecting with our own communities and being the change that we wanna see. Like we can connect and, and tell stories you know, e-bikes are the answer to everything. And <laughs> I put stories on LinkedIn about riding my e-bike and they're way more popular than any other boring technical thing. And they actually have power to change. So we can believe in ourselves, keep telling stories, keep becoming better storytellers, being open-minded again within that uh, kōrawai of manaakitanga and believing in um, our power to, to be the change. So thank you all. I'm just before I hand over to Richard, I would just start where uh, end where we started in that very grateful for the leaders um, that have shared uh, their stories with us today. You'll see on here, um, a, it popped up about uh, what else you need to do, but 
please, um, we do, this is all about collaboration. This is all about all of us working on it together. Please um, come back to us. This is the launch. This is not the end. This is the absolute very beginning. We would really love all of you uh, to input into our work in this climate action or share what you're doing in other forums. So please come back to us um, and we will send you all the links to that. But now, um, thank you once again. I'll hand over to Richard to end this session. Kia ora, Tania, and kia ora to our uh, panellists. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful information and insights you've shared. Thank you very much to our audience for your participation and the thoughtful questions. Um, I want to thank everyone for uh, attending and for sharing your ideas, both by presentation and by the questions. Um, as engineers, we are problem solvers. And it's really important that we do our bit to take action uh, on this complex issue because there's plenty of problems out there, so lots of opportunity to solve difficult challenges. Engineering New Zealand will be making more resources and tools available at the website I previously mentioned, engineeringclimateaction.nz. We really look forward to seeing you again. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you, everyone.